afternoon and welcome to the University of California Berkeley's Latinx Research Center, an interdisciplinary and Trans Americas research hub. The LRC focuses on the lives, experiences, challenges, and contributions of the diverse community of communities that is the Latinx population of the United States. I'm Laura Perez, chair of the Latinx Research Center. I warmly thank and welcome the co-editors of Decolonizing Latinx Masculinities and the contributors to this groundbreaking anthology who join us today on March 4th, 2021. Doctors Arturo Aldama, Frederick Aldama, Alberto Ledesma, Gabriel Estrada, Jackie Cuevas, Jenny Luna, Jonathan Gomez, and uh, Paloma Martinez Cruz. The Aldama brothers, Alberto Ledesma, Jenny Luna, Paloma Martinez Cruz, and Gabriel Estrada are also UC Berkeley alum. You do UC Berkeley proud. In your innovative scholarship, we see not only que si se puede, but wow, y como se puede. Gracias. A warm welcome to all of you who have registered for this event and join us via screen. Of the anthology that we are celebrating today, another UCB alum and queer Latinx cultural studies scholar, Professor Richard Ricky T. Rodriguez wrote, Decolonizing Latin X masculinities bristles with original insights and illuminating takes on an impressive array of expressive culture a refreshing and pathfinding collection that leaves behind exhausted considerations of Latinx masculinity. The essays collected here focus our attention on the ever shifting terms of debate concerning racialized genders and sexualities, end of quote. And indeed, as I wrote in my own review, decolonizing Latinx masculinities promises an important contribution to the still nascent study of the construction of Latina slash O slash X masculinities, and one that is inclusive of different forms of gender and sexuality identifications, including transgender, making it a particularly timely and innovative contribution. It is now my pleasure to introduce the co-editors of the anthology. In addition to co-editing the book that we are celebrating today, Arturo Aldama is also co-editor of Performing in the U.S. Latina and Latino Borderlands, Enduring Legacies, Ethnic Histories and Cultures of Colorado, Violence and the Body, Race, Gender and the State, and author of Disrupting Savagism, Intersection, Intersecting Chicana slash O, Mexican Immigrant and Native American Struggles for Self-Representation. He is Associate Professor and Associate Chair of the Department of Ethnic Studies and served as Director of the Center uh, for Studies in Ethnicity and Race in the Americas at CU Boulder. Arturo received his PhD from UCB's Department of Ethnic Studies. The LRC hosted the other co-editor, Frederick Luis Aldama, also known as Professor Latinx, two and a half years ago. Federico is a distinguished university professor at Ohio State and author of a stunning 40 plus books. Among his numerous awards, he received the International Latino Book Award and the Eisner Award for Latinx superheroes in mainstream comics. He is editor of the trade press Latino Graphics, creator of the first documentary on the history of Latinx superheroes and co-founder and director of Solcan, Brown, Black, and Indigenous Comics Expo and Symposium. In addition to writing about Chicanx literature, Latinx film, and US and third world people of color graphic novels and comics, Federico has written for children and young adults. This fall, he will publish a Spanish translation of his children's book, The Adventures of Chupacabra Charlie. And he will join UT Austin as the Jacob and Francis Sanger Massacre Chair in the Humanities, where he will launch a Latinx pop lab. We're really thrilled to have all of you, and I warmly welcome Federico to take over. Thank you, everyone. So my kind of launch, helping to launch, and thank you, uh, Laura, so much for that, and thank all of you for being here, and our audience members as well. What I really want us to do is maybe take a, a deep breath, and my, my colleague Paloma taught me this, 
to take a deep breath because I think what we are going to be hearing and seeing in the next um, hour or so is something that we need to take in to our hearts and our minds and our bodies in ways that go beyond the intellectual, beyond the kind of classroom, even in a way beyond the page and the academic kind of presence. Open our minds and bodies and our hearts to the incredible experiences that our colleagues are going to share with us opening us, waking us to all the nooks and all the crannies of existing as Latinxes across all different spectrums, not binaries, one or the other, but a whole range of beautiful, rainbow-colored, exquisite spectrums and everywhere, from everywhere, right? And this is so important because we have lived so long, our communities have suffered for so long, our families in environments where we have been straight jacketed and we have had nooses put around our souls, our hearts, our bodies, and where we've even seen some of our family members themselves act out of fear our community members acting out of fear in violent ways, expressing them in these misogynistic acts and homophobic acts. And so here I just welcome uh, our colleagues and you as uh, audience to open yourselves to the vibrations of the sounds and of the rhythms that take us back deep into our ancestral pasts when we could live and exist without the kinds of binaries that straitjacket and choke us today. And finally, to realize our full potentialities, right? As Latinxes in our full possibilities to exist in this world that we live in today. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Arturo. Thank you, and it's just so amazing to see all of you, and thanks for all of you for joining, and thanks, uh, Laura, Alberto, for um, hosting this event. I'm really nervous coming back to my alma mater. I'm usually not nervous about any of these things, but for some reason, coming back to Berkeley and next studies, I've been having uh, mariposas, you know, my tripa for, for days, actually. So anyway, I'm really excited to be here. Um, and a lot of the panelists here, you know, we, we are alums of Berkeley, either undergrad or grad or both and so on. So it's super, super exciting. Um, I'm just going to read just to kind of reinforce your very personal and spiritual message, <clears throat> Hermano Fede, uh, just a paragraph from the, a couple paragraph and a half from the intro. And then what we're going to do is just go in table of contents order with um, the, the amazing scholars, artists, activists that are part of this, of this, of this libro, of this book. So, um, and then hopefully, you know, we'll be able to engage in a really good uh, deep discussion uh, afterwards. So, uh, so no further ado, just to kind of um, um, <clears throat> uh, reinforce, I guess, what my brother just shared in a very personal testimonial uh, way. Um, is, um, <clears throat> see, so the, the main set of questions that really drive <clears throat> the aims of this book is what will it take for Latinx folks, families, families, and communities to decolonize toxic, toxic slash macho masculinities and rigid systems of patriarchy and misogyny? When and how will Latinx families and communities be able to love all children for what they are and honor how children feel, how, how they want to express themselves and how they want to grow into adults. When will Latinx boys and men be encouraged to really listen to, learn from and support mujeres, and I say mujeres with, with an X, and listen to, learn from and support transgender or two-spirit human beings and their struggles for survival and respeto? When will Latinx boys be encouraged to practice ways of being that are quote unquote strong and down with a deep politics of caring, compassion, and love for all humans and non-humans in a world of ever-increasing racist, misogynistic, homo-slash-transphobic homo violences? 
when will Latinx human beings be able to live with a sense of freedom, safety, and hope that lets us enact fluid and complex forms of agency, love, and intimacy that have broken free from the prison house of racialized neocolonial heteropatriarchies. Um, yeah, so um, the creative and scholarly voices that make up this volume don't appear out of nowhere. We stand arm locked in solidarities with those who have struggled to make visible a world that tries to brand us as reductive, destructive, and toxic, which traffics in misogyny and homophobia. We stand together to push against a Twitter space that brands us as race, rapists, medicals, predators, and diseased people or bad hombres. We stand together to quash those patriarchal narratives that force Latinas into corners by defining them as bad mothers, daughters, and sisters. Together, we fight an executive branch in mainstream media that champions heterothuggery and prom promulgates xenophobia. We do so by building actively and strengthening the queer, feminist, indigenous affirming borderland decolonial practice, praxis and practice of our cultural activists, predecessors and co partners. So with no further ado, um, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to uh, Alberto Ladesma. And so I'm gonna be teasing you a little bit. So for no other reason, if you don't buy the book, uh, buy the book for the pretty pictures. And the pretty pictures <laughs> in this particular case are, the phenomenal drawings that Alberto Ledesma, I didn't know you were such a talented artist when we were you know, in the PhD program together. It's amazing. Um, that really accompanying this really heartfelt testimonial and deep insights into uh, your stories, Alberto. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to you to kind of share a little bit about your powerful chapter. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you so much, Arturo. And thank you so much, uh, 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 Fed, uh, for you know, allowing me to be part of such a great collection of uh, works. Um, I, you know, it's such an honor, you know, just to uh, be uh, included. Um, you know, what I contributed um, is a short personal essay, a homage to an undocumented heartbreak that I really struggled to write. Um, in it, I wanted to reflect on that first moment of epiphany when I became aware of, uh, my masculine privilege and its relationship to my undocumented Mexican immigrant epistemology. And so what I wanna do is uh, Alberto, your volume is off, you're muted. Sorry, oh my God. So again, thank you so much to Arturo and uh, uh, Fede for allowing me to be in this wonderful collection. Um, what I uh, included in it is a short essay um, called Homage to an Undocumented uh, Heartbreak. It is um, uh, an essay that I actually struggled to write quite a bit. It, it, in it, I reflected um, on that uh, first moment of epiphany when I became aware of my masculine privilege and its relationship to my undocumented Mexican immigrant epistemology. And so what I wanna share is a couple of paragraphs where I reflect on the question, at what point do Mexican cisgender immigrant men interrogate the integrity of our subjective view of the world, especially in a, social, in a society that seems to want to detach us from our desire and reduce us to industrial machines meant to produce nothing but surplus capitalist value. So here's a couple of paragraphs from this, um, and this is pages 65 and then 77. I still remember, and I'll share my screen so there'll be those images that, um, um, that um, Arturo was making reference to. I still remember that Christmas uh, hue of the Safeway Marquee illuminating her scowl, how it flickered on and off on the contours of her smooth skin as she declared that she could no longer continue being my girlfriend. Three months earlier, I had waved goodbye as she boarded the midnight Aero Mexico nonstop to Guadalajara. Since then, I had been waiting impatiently fantasizing about all the things we would do once she was back in East Oakland 
But now as the motor on my father's station wagon idled and sputtered, all of our dreams of a long and blissful life together were being shattered by the reality of her rebuke. I just can't see myself being happy with someone who is also an illegal like me, she asserted matter of factly. Her brown irises focused on some distant point along Fruitville Avenue. I tried to think of something clever to say, to diffuse the sudden tension with humor, as I usually did when faced with similar situations. But nothing I had ever experienced could begin to compare with this. So I sat paralyzed, clutching the steering wheel of my father's station wagon tightly, frozen by the weight of that awful word she had deployed to defer to me, to us. I tried to understand why this was happening, sniffling and finding myself unable to look in her direction. Instead, instead I stared at my black sneakers resting lightly on the wagon's pedal, even as I fought a torrent of tears that was beginning to well in my eyes. I liked you when I thought you were a citizen, she summed up, then crossed her arms and turned towards the passenger side window. A citizen, there was no argument to be made on my part, no words that could undo the essential fact of who I was not. And then I turned to page 77. It has taken me more than three decades to realize that what Sonia Eugenia Flores allowed me to see that night when she broke up with me, even if momentarily, was the inextricable way that survival for the children of Mexican undocumented immigrants who aspire to a better life is tied to our ability to manage gender delusions. In many ways, you may think that the story that I have related here is one-sided, a chronicle that casts Sonia Eugenia as nothing more than the antagonist of a Mexican telenovela. But that is exactly my point. The truth is that I never really knew who Sonia Eugenia was. I was never really able to peer into her mind to understand her motivations, how long we would have lasted if she had been, uh, if I had been fact being a citizen, how long would I have been able, would, I have been, would it have been before she, we would have revealed ourselves to each other? Did my lack of status mean that those things that had originally attracted me to her would have been no longer valid? The tragedy of our encounter was that we might have been too much alike. Each of us done in a disguise in order to better our lives and that of our families only to discover too late after the fatal flaw had been revealed that our similarity would only compound our misery. And that is the danger of even a low level of machismo, of that subconscious set of patriarchal assumptions about what men and women should ideally act like that supposed patriarchal benevolence at the heart of fail, fuerte, and formal idealization flattens the earth into gendered shortcuts and prevents us from truly noticing the subtle details that contextualize our lives and make us who we are. No matter how much fun I thought we had, I was never able to remove those cultural biases from the way I perceived her, not until it was too late. And so for the rest, I would invite you to read the essay. Um, it is a story that um, I've heard repeated over and over again, uh, not just you know, um, in other um, stories of undocumented immigrants, um, but certainly one where the inability to really reflect on uh, Mexican masculinity, I think not having that language is a real obstacle uh, to our uh, deep understanding of um, many, many aspects of our culture. So I guess we'll go on now to the next person. Wonderful, muchas gracias, Alberto. Sure. Thank you. So next up we have uh, Jonathan Gomez uh, from currently at San Jose State, Mexican American Studies, and you have a postdoc, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't share that quite yet, but yes, sir. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I let the cat out of the bag. Anyway, amazing work. So, Jonathan, take it away. It's a beautiful, beautiful essay. So, right on, right yeah. on. Uh, thank you so much, you know, to uh, Arturo and Frederick for your belief in my work and your invitation to contribute uh, to this magnificent uh, volume. 
uh, to the Latinx Research Institute at UC Berkeley. Thank you for organizing the event. And special thanks to uh, Dr. Perez. You know, when I was a graduate student, you know, you you chose to take me on as a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley, and you know that that year with you uh, at Cal really made an impact on me. And so thank you very much uh, for choosing to, to take me on. Um, it's always a blessing for me to, you know, speak about uh, or actually talk about, teach and research about the political willingness and spiritual dynamism of Chicanx art and culture. And for all of us here today, we know that, you know, this is no ordinary time to be having the conversation that has called us into community today. As we meet here, millions of people from around the world have died because of COVID-19. And in the US, thousands of people have been forced to become houseless. And the threat of eviction looms over the futures of so many more. In communities across this country, young people go hyper-police yet underserved. And worst of all, people who face problems because of the breakdown of societal institutions are turned into the problem by dominant social groups who care more for profits than they do for the humanity of others. Lisa Tiny Gray Garcia of Poor Magazine describes our COVID-19 conjuncture as one where politicians at every level lack the backbone to meaningfully implement policies and practices to protect the most vulnerable among us. Through her poverty scholarship, we see that the most impoverished women of color make up the majority of those who go most harmed, demonized and disrespected by the contradictions endemic in capital accumulation. Our time presents challenges to movements for freedom. In fact, our time gives form to many obstacles that frustrate and challenge the development and practice of mutual recognition and mutual respect. However, it is important for us to remember that our time is also an oppositional conjuncture where members of social movements shake up social life, envision and enact ways of knowing, ways of being, and ways of collectively imagining how uh, to get out of the crisis and constriction that marks our lives. As scholars rush to contribute to this work, I strongly contend that, it is, uh, um, that in the struggle for a livable destiny, that we think deeply about who we are in this mix. Who is it that we want to become and what kind of relationships do we want to forge with people who are on the ground standing up for social justice? I did not always consider the importance of, of self-definition in relationship to social justice endeavors that I engaged in at the university or in the neighborhoods beyond it. And in fact, in my contribution to the book, I share that I came to grapple with this when veteran Chicana mural artist Norma Montoya invited me to have a conversation with her about a set of murals she painted in the City Terrace Barrio of East LA in the 1970s. My chapter focuses specifically on how my accompaniment uh, of Montoya provided me with lessons in community-based, gender-conscious and equity-oriented dialogic thinking uh, at an important period in my doctoral training at UC Santa Barbara. Working with Montoya was part of my own personal journey of envisioning and becoming the type of scholar and the type of man who is caring of and attentive to the needs of oppressed people in their communities. I inhabited the practice that Barbara Tomlinson and George Lipsitz name as accompaniment, an important collective sensibility and form of social science inquiry that emerges from friendly, humble, and mutually respectful relationships with the members of aggrieved groups who are the frontline eyewitnesses to exploitation and exclusion. In an era of neoliberal hegemonic individualism, accompaniment compels scholars to place an emphasis on making connections with others, identifying with them and helping them. Through this way of knowing and being, scholars can better understand the work we do in relationship to the world in which we live not as distant, detached, or disengaged practitioners of professional advancement, but as social justice seekers looking for people who are looking for us. Distinct from dropping science on people as a method of community engagement, accompaniment is interested in learning from and acting with oppressed communities in order to figure out how to appropriately face up to the challenges that wreak havoc in their lives. It identifies the terrains of collective struggle and collaborative study as sites where research questions are asked and answered from the ethical vantage points of the eyewitnesses to hierarchy and injustice. In the piece, I go on to argue that for scholars interested in developing honest and respectful masculinities, I believe that the life, art, and activism of Norma Montoya offer important insights about how to become the people we need to be 
in our own times of crises. Within the university campuses uh, and across them, we confront challenging problems that stem from what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called a thing-oriented society. In this social world, we embody masculine social identities marked by an impulse that seeks fame and fortune, that desires things and turns us as humans into things. A rich alternative tradition embodied in the art and activism of Chicana artist Norma Montoya leads us in another direction, towards the development of spaces, identities, and relationships that are invested in being more in touch with our own humanity and the humanity of others. While scholars study and teach about the material and social consequences of racialized and gendered inequality and injustice, the systemic attack by powerful political officials and dominant social groups on working class communities, especially women of color, threatens to naturalize hierarchies that wreak havoc all over the world. Working class women of color should not be seen as people to be helped, but rather as people uh, to learn from and walk with. And I know that I still have uh, much to learn about disinvesting from male privilege, about accompanying women, and about the difficult tasks ahead if I'm to become the person I will need to be in order to be worthy of Montoya's trust and respect as we move forward. But I would like folks to know that she has started me up down this path and there's no turning back. Thank you. Wow. Muchas gracias. Wow, wow, wow. Amazing. Okay. All right, so um, I'm just going to read a couple paragraphs from uh, my chapter on um, the horrible, horrible series Breaking Bad, uh, and then this phenomenal uh, film and politics of space and Mosquita Imari by Aurora Guerrero, who's also a Chicano Studies UC Berkeley uh, alum too. So uh, anyway, um, okay, muy bien. And then next up, we'll um, <clears throat> we'll have. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Jackie T. Cuevas, who has, at least for the students in my department at CVOL, their cult following, cult following with a capital C. But anyway, um, all right. So um, yeah, the title of my chapter is Decolonizing Predatory Masculinities and Breaking Bad y Mosquita y Mari. This chapter contrasts representations of raci racist and racialized hegemonic masculinities in the award-winning five-season AMC series Breaking Bad, 2008 to 13 with Aurora Guerrero's portrayal of Chicanex with an X, teens resisting coercion, docility, surveillance, formal slash informal violences, and arguably neo-colonial heteropatriarchies in her award-winning feature film, Mosquita y Mari. The first half of the chapter, <clears throat> which addresses Breaking Bad, will consider one, the distorted, ahistorical, pred predictable deployment of the tropes of the pa pathological and hyperviolent male Chicano native subjects, of New Mexico and the borderlands, and two, the way in which Walter White consumes brown bodies in his will to power as the most lethal meth chemist cook, beginning in New Mexico and expanding to Mexico and further south in the hemisphere. This analysis documents how White's deployment of whiteness and pathological masculinity destroys bodies, lands, and communities to feed his neocolonial hunger for entitlement and power and how the writer Vince Gilligan attempts to sterilize slash normalize this predatory violence. The second half of the chapter discusses how the film Mosquita y Mari provides a decolonial rupture for predictable tropes of the representation of Latinx subjects, showing Chicanex teen mujeres who navigate and resist the practice of compulsory heteronormativity slash ease, patriarchy and surveillance, in doing so, these Chicanex youth and working class Huntington Parque, California, create liberatory spaces that challenge heteropatriarchy and put into practice gestures of liberatory sexual futures. And the whole discussion of gestures is really huge, huge, huge props to Juana Maria, who's I guess now the chair of, uh, of ethnic studies and uh, also was in the PhD program back in the day. Phenomenal, phenomenal book. The queer, queer gestures is like, wow. Um, <clears throat> The chapter addresses the politics of space and intimacy and how cars and car culture in the form of either cruising around with friends or parked and or abandoned cars contribute to both the reification of heteropatriarchal norms and a liberation to explore feelings. The chapter concludes by discussing the threat and imminence, imminence with an A and imminence with an I of patriarchal heteronormative violence that circumscribes safe spaces and reinforces the sexualized masculine gaze upon and consumption of these young teens. 
By bringing these seemingly dissimilar sites of representation and gender performances into conversation, my hope is to provide a discussion of how masculinities are constructed and performed in racialized neocolonial social, symbolic, and cultural economies. After considering the representations of predatory masculinities in Breaking Bad and Mosquita y Mari, I ended the chapter with a reflection on the complexities of negotiating the violences of being criminalized by Euro-Western norms in the state. I do so by asking how Latinx men can decolonize the legacies of misogyny and homophobia imposed through the Spanish invasion of the Americas or Abayala and reified by the Catholic Church and how they can resist the ongoing male to male violences that drive the exaltation slash glorification of the performances of toxic masculinities in our current body politic, e.g. Donald Trump, Brett Kavanaugh, and other white men in power who relish their ability to violate the bodies and sovereignties of the other. So uh, that's enough for now. Hopefully you'll get, you know, curioso or curious to uh, read, check out the chapter. Gracias. Um, next, we're going to go ahead and move to Dr. Jackie T. Cuevas. Again, cult following, uh, at least at Curacy Roll. Your work's like, wow. So anyway. Thank you. Some. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you to everybody who uh, organized the event as well. Thank you, Dr. Perez, for hosting us. And thank you to the fabulous editors. I'm going to read from a chapter called Fighting the Good Fight, Grappling with Queerness, Masculinities, and Violence in Contemporary Latinx Literature and Film. And I'm just going to read from uh, a bit of the intro and a bit of the, the conclusion, just so you can get a gist of that. Okay. At the end of the film adaptation of Justin Torres's novel, We the Animals, the young protagonist walks away from his family's home in rural upstate New York, intending to run away to a big city in search of a queer life that seems impossible to live at home. As he is leaving his house for good, he recovers his personal writing journals, which his family discarded in the outdoor rubbish bin. Armed with his writing, in which he has fantasized about erotic encounters with men, he sets off toward a presumed queer liberation. A jubilant queer reading of this ending might lead viewers to rejoice at the young boys following through on his desire to move toward a queer future, particularly given what he is walking away from, a violent family, family life with an abusive father. In this walking away from patriarchal violence, this brings the film into conversation with two other contemporary Latinx queer films, La Mission and Bruising for Besos. Like La Mission, written and directed by Peter Bratt, and Bruising for Besos, written and directed by Adelina Anthony, We the Animals, directed by Jeremiah Zager, and based on the novel by Justin Torres, grapples with complex relationships between and across queerness and masculinities. All three films decouple violence and masculinity, making significant moves to delink violence from queer Latinx masculinities. To interpret how these films, along with the novel We the Animals, um, and, and the, uh, including the uh, Adelina Anthony's Bruising for Bessels, the play that the movie is based on, to interpret how these films construct new forms of queer Latinx masculinities. I engage with Sarah Ahmed's post-structuralist and phenomenological feminist theory. Ahmed's work on what she terms unhappy queers provides a, sorry, provides a productive reading, a way of reading these contemporary cultural texts. Through queer imaginings, familial leave-taking, and a combination of queer Latinx survival movidas, the unhappy queers in these narratives productively reject heteropatriarchal violence in favor of Latinx queer world-making. I suggest that what these contemporary films and their attendant literary works offer us are visions of Latinx masculinities delinked from intimate relational violence. In these texts, Latinx masculinities are delinked not only from hegemonic conceptions of masculinities as heteronormative, but also from hegemonic misconceptions of Latinx masculinities as somehow more predisposed to violence, criminality, and or dominance than other forms of masculinities within patriarchy more, more broadly. These queer Latinx texts interrogate, critique, and ultimately transform Latinx masculinities. And for now, you're just going to have to trust me on my readings of the texts or get the book, because um, I'm going to zoom forward to the conclusion so you can kind of just get a gist of the frame that I'm developing here. So conclusion is on uh, Latinx queer world making without violence. As contemporary queer Latinx narratives, La Mission, We the Animals, and Bruising for Besos work to delink masculinity from violence and the imperative to use it to enforce dominance, opening up the boundaries of what masculinity can mean. 
as the protagonists urge themselves toward developing less, damage, less damaging relationalities, they construct new forms of queer Latinx masculinities that leave violence and violent patriarchs behind, orienting queer Latinx masculinities as being against violence. The main characters in these queer Latinx narratives deploy various strategic survival movidas, such as Latinx queer world making and making queer and trans familia to de-link violence from their lives. As they do so, the unhappy queers bring attention to the structural and familial reasons behind their unhappiness. Ahmed argues that those who are unable and or unwilling to be happy and make themselves happy within current structures of normativity may be seen not only as unhappy queers, but as also unwilling subjects. Such unwilling subjects do not bend to the will of patriarchs or the structures of power and normativity that work to impose men's dominance and circumscribe women, femininity, and queerness. Happiness in its normative formation is impossible for these subjects because violence is used to wield power and suppress women and queer people. They become unwilling subjects of normativity and its violent enforcement by refusing to accept the brutal punishments, by leaving violent home spaces, and by demanding that queerness becomes central to their lives. All three narratives raise critical questions about what love can and should look like, what queers can do for themselves and each other when a family's form of quote unquote love is damaging and dangerous, and how queer Latinx masculinities can move beyond heteropatriarchal violence toward thriving queer Latinx lives. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. That was phenomenal. So next up, we have Paloma, this uh, rock star, also alum from Chicano studies back in the day. And it's all about Chicano Dracula. So ah! take it away, Paloma. <laughs> hey, Arturo. Good to see you. Yay. I'm here. Um, you know, I graduated from Cal uh, 91, was that? No, 97, 96, 97, one of those. You know how like a lot of Chicanx students kind of blur the graduation date, you know? I walked, but I gotta take five more classes. You know, that kind of, <laughs> at least that's how it went down in, in my day. Um, my first Latinx lit class, I took it with Arturo when he was a graduate student. I took my first feminist hemispheric Latinx class with Dr. Laura Perez and Frederick Aldama has mentored me since I was at, since I came to Columbus um, at the Ohio State University. So just so much love to be in this community and so honored and this is a, this is a, an amazing homecoming. So thank you for extending this to me. Um, the, the space that I also, what I'd like to also bring some gratitude into this space. Um, Frederick, thank you for, for opening up with that powerful taking of breath, taking stock, looking at our ancestors, locating ourselves in, in, in the five directions. And in that spirit, I'd like to bring forth the name of my cousin, uh, Manny Duran, Manuel Duran. He passed away in the late 80s of AIDS-related bronchial pneumonia. And it was a death that was not cared for and acknowledged. He, 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 his queerness was not spoken or acknowledged. Um, the illness, the, the family didn't circle around him um, the way they should have. And I, and I look around and I'm, I'm very heartened by how much work um, we've done and and um, and very encouraged by the prospects of what we're going to be getting into um, and how this volume is is contributing to that in such a powerful way and how this conversation contributes to that in a powerful way it, it's life-giving um, and so for Manny uh, I'm, I'm opening just a few thoughts on on Chicano Dracula because you know the Chicanada has got to get goth, right? I mean, we're nothing if we're not good at being goth. Uh, and, and there's some ancient roots in that. If you think about the Iberian Peninsula and the, the, the Inquisition, and, and you think about the horrors of the Catholic Church and you flip it, right? You flip, kind of flip that cross upside down and then you got goth, but you're still carrying forward these ancestral you know, burdens. And, and I, I find that fascinating. So I had first written about the Latin lover who, and in around the time, and this was published in the popular culture book that Frederick Aldama edited. 
um, I was, I was interested in, in, I, I love pop culture. I love kitsch. I love goth, but also, um, around the time that the 45th president president was elected, we know all of us gathered here. We, we understand that he wasn't elected in spite of saying that Mexicans were rapists. He was elected because of it. And I really needed to understand and, and kind of get into how ready this country is to reify that message of Latinx male sexual predation. How available this country is for that. How ready, uh, you know, and how hallelujah when, when that gets sounded uh, in, in a public sphere when that enters into the public and people don't have to apologize for it, right? They can finally, ah, with, with the 45th guy, you know, there was just a, there was a, a parade uh, because people couldn't finally, you know, shed some of that hate that they had been trying to politely, um, you know, been, been compelled to, to politely keep out of the public political discourse um, in, in more, in, in the more mainstream it was going on, but um, he really unleashed the floodgates. Uh, the Latin lover in Hollywood was sedimented with, you know, began and, 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 and sprouted criteria for what that was with Rudolph Valentino in the silent film in the 1920s. Um, but even before you had Don Juan um, in 1630 by the dramaturg Tirso de Molina, and then you had um, Lord Byron write um, an epic poem, you know, about a lustful Spaniard um, in the figure of Casanova. So this was something that was already Western and Northern Europe were, were already looking at the Roman, the Latin, as being people who were fundamentally more sexual than their Protestant counterparts. There was somehow license and licentiousness associated with that. Um, with those areas, with those territories. Um, then I was interested, I, I think, I, I can't remember the exact moment, but I think I was doing one of my, you know, deep Halloween, I said, gotta be goth, right? So every Halloween in my household, we we celebrate by investing in a different monster, or different, you know, this last year was witches. Um, it's been Frankensteins, but I think a couple years back, we got into Dracula, right? The Dracula mythology. And I was seeing the Latin lover everywhere. Once you start seeing this, you see it everywhere, right? Like when you're writing that term paper and that, that whatever it is that you're doing, like decolonize, and then you're seeing it everywhere, you know? So for me, the Latin lover, I was seeing him everywhere. And certainly I saw him when we were investigating the Dracula mythology. Bela Lugosi, right? Raul Julia uh, as Gomez Adams. Um, and, and just everywhere that I was looking at Dracula, I was seeing that accented, swarthy, sexually predatory so that that the latin lover i understood that dracula was housing another version of that don juan of that casanova and so i'll read a couple of paragraphs where i had my aha moment um and it goes a little like this where was my and it goes a little like this. As Valentino was to the Hollywood Latin lover, Lugosi was to the legend of Dracula, the Latin lover's moving picture pathway into the horror genre, where he has remained steadfast. In keeping with this genre's tenor, I offer a Latinx Van Helsing-esque reveal to qualify the dark master's adhesion to the Latin lover formula through the following acronym. And I have to write D R No, the last one is A. Okay. Dracula. -ua. Let's just pretend I spelled it right in the in the chat. Dracula. I, you know, that was a lot of pressure on me. I let's give myself some room. Um Dracula. So dark. No, the D. Rapacious aristocratic, captivating, undocumented. Dracula is undocumented, right? 
um, Latin derived and let's skip uh, and accented. Okay. When it comes to Dracula, darkness is not just the shroud of night protecting the count from the sun. It also describes the physical coloring of Latin lovers who have been depicted with Romanesque features in nearly all the major portrayals of Dracula since Lugosi's performance of the Count. Thank you, Abraham. <laughs> That's why you have editors, right? <laughs> Chat, you know, you have a spell check in there. Thank you. I really appreciate the help. Um, Okay, next, the sexually rapacious nature of Dracula's storied eroticism is such that he sets sights on not just one, but two Western women, Lucy and Mina. If he were to have only one erotic obsession, it could be tamed through its consummation in the pact, whether sacred or sacrilegious, of a lasting monogamous union. Next, his aristocracy, like the wealth associated with Valentino's Desnoyers, it establish him, establishes him as an international playboy. He is adrift, but not derelict. His world populated by old things and old ways. At the beginning of Stoker's novel, Count Dracula informs the solicitor, Jonathan Harker, we Transylvanian nobles love not to think that our bones may be amongst the common dead. As for his captivating gaze, if the production techniques of silent film required lingering takes of Valentino's seductive stare to represent the lure of his glance, Lugosi's eyes in the role of Dracula literally hypnotize, constituting his signature move of both aggression and seduction. And Lugosi had that amazing like thing that like he like kind of put his hand out there when he was hypnotizing. You know? Next, Dracula also represents the undocumented denizens of Western society. In his early conversations with the newly credentialed young attorney, Jonathan Harker, the Count is gravely concerned, get it, gravely concerned that his coffin-sized crates of funky Roman dirt will not make it through customs. And he contrives to retain the services of several attorneys in various seaports in order to slip his cargo past local agents, as is done often in Harker's words, by men of business who do not like the whole of their affairs to be known by any one person. Yes, his travels to London, his travel to London is mired in illicit dealings misrepresentation at ports of entry, and the deaths of a retinue of shipmates on the Russian vessel that transports his undead person and his special dirt of the damned to England. Moreover, the count is Latin derived, as a Romance language, Romanian, is spoken in his home of Transylvania, a region located in central Romania. Speaking English with a heavy accent, the actor Bela Lugosi, who was born in the Kingdom of Hungary, now Lugos, Romania, had the Eastern European locution by which, with which the fictive Dracula was associated. Although Harker was thoroughly impressed with the Count's mastery of English vocabulary and grammar, Dracula was aware of the stigma that Londoners would attach to his manner of speech. Here I am, a noble. The common people know me, and I am a master. But a stranger in a strange land, he is no one. Men know him not, and to know not is to care not for." End quote. Aware that his strangeness of speech would mark him as an outsider, Lugosi found that it was his in real life fate to be steadily typecast as the dark other throughout his acting career. The intonation that made the Dracula role such a seamless fit for his abilities also marked him as the villain whom audiences were primed by centuries of colonial stereotypes to care not for. And I'll leave it at that. Wow. Oh, wow. That was phenomenal, phenomenal. All right. So next up, we actually have a really beautiful and powerful uh, co-authored piece by um, <clears throat> Ginny, Dr. Ginny Luna and uh, Dr. Gabriel Estrada, also two Chicano Studies uh, alums from Cal. So um, 
really exciting. And we'll, as we say in Mexico, cerrar con broche de oro with the, the gold, the gold, you know, ribbon, so to speak. So take it away, Jenny and Gabriel. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to the Los Hermanos Aldama. Thank you for bringing us together in this beautiful work. And I, and I want to give a special thank you to my co-author, to Gabriel Estrada, because this opportunity to work together was a dream. Uh, to be able to write this piece and it was really 10 years in the making and the fact that this work is in this anthology means a lot to both of us and so um, I had such a wonderful time um, creating this piece and so I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs um, the title of our of our chapter is uh, translating the gender queer x through Kashkan, Nawa, and Chicanx indigena knowledge and uh, really the behind this piece um, was thinking about language. Both of us studied the Nahuatl language and thinking about um, the significance of the X, the X and Chicanx and Latinx and what that means. And so also really trying to deconstruct um, how do we think about uh, this movement of, of the Latinx, the Chicanx, um, how do we think about it from an indigenous epistemology? And so that was really the, the main question. Um, and so I'm going to put in the chat, this is actually the title of the section that I'm going to be reading a couple of paragraphs from in thinking about what do we call ourselves and just kind of grappling with that. Um, so the X, um, let me start with, Nahuatl and Kashkan have a bounded linguistic interface with the genderqueer X recently adopted by Latinx and Chicanx writers. In the 1990s, an offshoot of the Chicano movement produced a renewed spelling of the term Chicano with a CH beginning with an X, Chicano. The X arguably stands from the X in Mexico, which was fought for as a national reminder of Nahuatl linguistic roots. Whereas older spellings of Mexico use the Spanish J instead of an X in Mexico. The new Mexican state reclaimed the X in Mexico and Mexica. However, this state reclamation of indigenismo was a racialized logic that favored modern mestizo identity rather than supporting living Nahua and indigenous pueblos. Um, move down. Uh, while the term Chicano with an X derives from the Nahua term Mexica, it is important to note that the Nahua language existed before the Mexica migrated south into what is now Mexico City. The contemporary notion that Chicano with an X is only related to the Mexica versus other indigenous peoples within Mexico came about because of Chicano nationalist movements that at times inferred this limited meaning. Today, the word Chicano with an X is taking on new meanings that reject Mexica centrism and instead can be viewed from a broader perspective, one that more widely embraces the Yudo Nahuatl, Mayan and other indigenous language families spoken throughout the Americas. Inclusivity would move beyond the Eurocentric Western gender binary of AO and the X would once again be a marker of resistance. While the X in this usage is not an intentional marker of indigeneity, one could argue that in effect, the reinscription of the letter remains a marker that resists Eurocentric constructions of language and therefore is potentially an indigenous form of resistance. At the same time, other indigenous beliefs, such as contemporary Zapatista philosophy, believe that gender is not binary, but rather complementary. And they prefer the aroba or the at sign rather than the X to keep both rather than, the, than delete them altogether. We insert our own postulation that perhaps the at symbol can be viewed as a caracol that represents the universe, which is in constant spiral motion. With regard to gender, this caracol symbol supposes that rather than a linear spectrum, gender is more like the spiral of the caracol in constant fluidity and motion. The at or aroba also honors the dual duality that exists in everything. This dual duality is the understanding that not only does duality exist in the form of two complementary, complementary entities, um, but it also exists within each single entity. For example, within one human body, there is duality. The same can be said for the earth, sky, and every element and or entity that exists. Each of these in and of itself is also dual in nature. At the same time, the ultimate meaning of duality is not so much the idea that there are only two ways of being, rather 
Duality as a concept attempts to acknowledge the importance of balance and change. From an indigenous perspective, to walk in balance is to walk in beauty. By accepting and embracing all parts of ourselves, we achieve balance and beauty. So what we can learn from Kashkan, Nawa, and Chikanex Indigena wisdom knowledge um, that can help us move forward our conversations about gender, masculinity, and indigeneity. Ultimately, if we are truly examining ways to decolonize masculinity and gender, we must begin by acknowledging that the notion of oppositional gender binary is Eurocentric at its roots. Yet that Eurocentric binary is the place where most conversations begin. Rather than beginning from this Eurocentric premise, we argue that there are multiple ways of knowing gender. And one of these ways is through an indigenous epistemology. But to infuse our conversation with indigenous wisdom requires each of us to do the work of reconnecting to our own indigenous philosophies which in our case begins with Kashkan philosophy. Our work must begin with a radical reconnection, both relearning and remembering our indigenous ph philosophical roots in order to have a deeper understanding of gender analysis. Often our political histories of naming have limited our possibilities rather than expanded them. Therefore, we are exploring the X and its usage, remembering and reconnecting to its origins rooted in Nahuatl language. Simultaneously, we argue that decolonizing masculinity and gender goes beyond the limited gesture of a single letter X. If we are examining gender from a Nawa or indigenous perspective, we must first examine the purpose. And so I'll stop there and hand it over to my colega and friend, Gabriel. Gracias, Jenny. That was beautiful. Casa Kamati to my colega Jenny and to everyone here. Um, for this time. And so I'm taking a little note from, from Paloma, realizing that we can actually type things to our attendees. And that would be different than just uh, speaking. So um, what I'm doing is putting into the chat a list of words. And this will explain some of the differences between Spanish and uh, Gashka which is a, a variant of Nahuatl uh, from Western Mexico, uh, the Jalisco, Zacatecas, Aguascalientes area. So we can take a word like macho, uh, which could mean something like masculine, right? Maybe some people think hyper-masculine. And if we say macha, I think of, oh, all the lesbianas at UC Berkeley when I was undergrad were like, you know, they were like machas, right? Um, now I think, well, maybe the matcha we could say is transmasculine as well. The matcha may be a masculine, transfeminine person if we want to mix it up, right? Think of the different possibilities. Uh, if we're taking a cue from Professor Latinx, then we could say machex. And to say someone of, of indeterminate, you know, a genderqueer uh, person who, who is, has some masculinity, uh, I myself identify as, as a two-spirit person, uh, as a genderqueer person. Um, and this is um, my work that I do in LA. Um, and, uh, you know, through Chicano parents, um, my patrilineage is, um, well, I was going to say matrilineage first. <laughs> it's it's Chiene, it's Chirico Apache and Oramuri. And through my, my grandfather's, it's uh, Kashka uh, uh, Chichimeca. So, um, you know, so we're, we're a mix of different masculine, feminine sides, uh, different, um, different nations. And so I'm here talking about the Gashka nation of, of uh, Huchipila and, um, and the language. So Gashka language, um, C-A-X-C-A-N, uh, doesn't have a gender class. So the difference between the thing like, you know, Machex having this kind of gender neutral ending is that in Gashka language, there's no gender class. And now what? There's no gender class. There's no possibility in most indigenous languages to put a masculine or feminine ending on something. So we can say okichti, which is hombre, man, or masculine. Um, you know, or we can say siwat, which is mujer, woman, or, or feminine, you know, maybe a trans feminine person. Uh, or we can say takat, which is a person. And that's, you know, doesn't make any reference to the person's uh, gender. And we can combine, we can say okich takat, which is hombre man person or siwa takat, mujer woman person, but takat itself is just a person. So I'm here on Tongva territory in Los Angeles. It's a takic language and that comes from the word for person, 
right? We have relationships among you know, Aztec languages um, extending from almost the border of Canada with Shoshone going all the way down to historically to, to Panama um, with Southern parts of Nahuatl um, diaspora down there. So I'll go ahead and just read the paragraph where I say that in, in other words, uh, it says, while part of what an indigenized gender queer X represents is an interruption of the colonization and male female sexual hierarchies, the X or X reconfigurations are still operating according to a partially European construction of language. For example, actual Nahuatl unpossessed noun endings rarely end in the X suffix, but instead end in TL, LI, and TLI, and more often T, LI, and T in Kashka language. It's a different variant. We have different endings. As related in the 1765 Nahuatl and Kashka and vocabulary and confessional by Cortez y Zedeño, the Kashka T noun ending of both Siwataka, mujer, woman, person, and Okichtaka, woman, man, person, are exactly the same. In contrast with the masculine O and feminine A gender class endings in Spanish, they mark the feminine word macho as butch woman and the masculine word macho as butch man. Taka by itself merely means person and is not gendered in the same way that all Kashka nouns are not gendered, unless the heart or root of the noun is combined with another modifying words like okishti for man and siwat for woman, as we just observed. So, so our main idea in the article is that yes, the X, the Ekis can help to create a genderqueer language, um, especially in pluralities, right? So if we're all here, we say nosotros, right? <laughs> so we can have not just nosotros, if there's one, you know, masculine person in the group. Um, have to wait till we're all femme to say nosotras, right? All my femme queens out there. Um, so, you know, the X does have a, a, a utility in giving us some gender queer language within Indo-European languages, right? Within English and, and Spanish and Spanglish and all the, the Chicano, Spanish and Cabo and all the mixes of, of languages. But um, even though if we say the sh as an Nahuatl pronunciation of the X, when we get to actually the Kashka, Nahuatl is totally different. It, it means there are no gender class and we don't have to use that because nothing, there is no possibility of creating a gendered ending. So it's already gender neutral, we shall say. And so, um, so we go into other aspects of the history and cis heteropatriarchal colonization of language. We go from a gender, you know, uh, variants <laughs> within our, our indigenous uh, nations to a system that is colonial and cis heteropatriarchal. We're forced to be man or woman, forced to have a hierarchy, right? Men over women, um, heterosexual people over, you know, homosexuals or cisgender people over transgender people. And that is, and that is not our indigenous way. That's not where we are coming from historically in contemporary times for those who are traditionalists. So I'll go ahead and leave it with that and um, take it to the next person. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Gabriel. This is amazing, 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 amazing. You know, everyone's always talking about like <clears throat> indigenous language and gender, and you're actually explaining a lot of things that a lot of us want to learn. So this is really powerful. Gracias. Okay, well, cool. This is, um, now we're going to kind of come to hopefully be able to engage and, you know, have a deep talk about stuff. I want to make a plug and then also, um, the editor, the editor in chief, and the marketing person of U of A, I guess, is in a good mood. So I'm going to put in the ch chat a 40% uh, discount code for all books at the U of A. And uh, when I we did a similar kind of event event though in, in Boulder, uh, literally like a week or so after the book came out, and they only provided a 20% code just for this book. So anyway, so now you get a 40% code for any book at uh, University of Arizona. And then just a little bit of shameless uh, promotion, just because I'm recognizing a lot of phenomenal scholars and just people that have, you know, Fred and I have known for years. Um, if any of you are looking to do a book project, uh, this series is really a, a great, uh, is a great, you know, <clears throat> we've convinced U of A, they're really, really amazing to work with. They get the books in print usually way before they're scheduled, their production is phenomenal, and there's just no head games like other presses. You know, uh, other presses, you're just like, what is the person really trying to say? Yes means yes, no means no, 5 p.m. You know, because when you're publishing, especially if you're for tenure and all of that stuff, you don't want to play around with, you know, trying to read between the lines and stuff like that. So the cool thing is that uh, 
the series allows smaller books inspired by the Stanford short book series and other presses. So it can be as small as, you know, <clears throat> 30, 40,000 words. Um, and also a book that's about to be coming out has, I think, how many images does John Michael book have? Like 30 or something, Fred, or 27, something like that? Yeah, so 27 full color images. So it's just a different, more exciting and more evocative way to do the kind of scholarship that we do within kind of Chicanx cultural studies. Um, and they're just really, really amazing to work with. So and if you have projects that you're thinking about, second book, third book, first book, um, feel free to reach out to Fred and I. We like to move really quickly. We like to be really supportive, especially to younger scholars. And um, they're just great, great to work with. So I'm gonna put the coupon code in the chat. And um, yeah, if you're looking for some uh, great books and Chicanx borderland stuff, indigenous borderland stuff, et cetera, et cetera, 40% off, you can't go wrong. So, okay, cool. That's enough of my capitalist plug, I guess. So I'll set up now and just see what y'all have to say, questions, comments, responses. We, um, we do have questions here already. Um, should we go ahead and, um, so uh, one question, I think the one of the first ones here, which is a, a really, really important question that we've all been thinking about for a long time um, in our own families, even I know Arturo and I, um, we've, we've heard of one of our tias who is um, Afro, um, Latina, Mexican, um, but hasn't really been a part of the family. And um, this kind of leads us to this, the question here that the anonymous attendee asked about Latinx masculinities through an anti-colorism lens. And I think, um, you know, who, who would want to take that first question? Um, I know we all kind of deal with it, um, but some of you, like Jonathan, I think you deal with it um, pretty specifically toward the end of your chapter. But Alberto, maybe do you want to launch us on that one? Um, I mean, yeah, that, that's a big, big question. I mean, I think that um, certainly in terms of the challenges around racial analysis um, in, a, in a Latinx context, um, it's, it's clear that um, it's been it's been a difficulty, you know, um, where um, I don't think that we've had the uh, language to really reflect on the complexity of our experience. And so, um, while the experience, the lived experience, and the history is there, and there's a lot of pain in the history um, that often has been hidden because the language hasn't chronicled that pain. Um, I think that, you know, we, we haven't done enough of it. And, and, and I think sometimes, and maybe, the, maybe this is what, what this question is getting at, that, that sometimes we uh, reify exactly the historical pain by not the deliberately and actively um, using that as a primary lens of analysis in our own work. And, and, and I, I, I agree. I mean, I think that that's something that we need to deal, do a little bit more of. That, that's the main thing that I'm thinking of, um, that we need to have maybe more of a kind of um, a holistic approach in our critical analysis. Um, although, I'll, you know, I mean, you know, to be fair, I mean, this, this work focused on an analysis of masculinity itself, you can't divorce that from other uh, marginalities that or um, that that we're looking at, you know, that uh, that matrix, you know, um, uh, um, if you're trying to be really critical and situate that, um, that's that's the first thought that I have. Wow. Jonathan, do you want to follow, maybe? Oh yeah, sorry, Arturo. Go ahead, yeah. right, yeah. No, I guess I'm not really following the question through an anti-colorism lens. Yeah, I think if I'm, if, well, maybe I'm hoping I'm reading this correctly, but maybe Arturo, do you want to chime in on this? Yeah, I assume just, you know, getting that, you know, <clears throat> folks that are light skinned, folks that, you know, can, are read more Afro Latino, folks that are read more as indigenous, right? I, mean, all I think that the pigmentocracy sometimes that's, that's how it's referred yeah. to in some of the, I mean, Diego Vigil, that's, that's how he discusses right. it in his work. Yeah. Right. 
I mean, what I can say on a personal level is, you know, I've lost touch with a lot of my cousins, but we have very, 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 very dark skinned cousins. And I just have extreme, I mean, I'm talking extreme levels of guilt because my grandma, my abuelita, can pass this cancer, who was very dark skinned herself. She treated me like, you know, because I was güero, I was light skinned, like, you know, I was special, you know, as a young child and would constantly be like, oh, look at, you know, Arturo, he's so güero and bonito and look how prieto and ugly and Mexican you are, right? So, you know, <clears throat> like Ivan, I mean, Ivan's really, you know, he probably passed as African-American or really dark, he's just really dark skin, right? And so, yeah, I just, you know, I, I'm, I'm really guilty when I see them because I, I just the differential treatments that you know, that my abuelita was reinforcing all of these tropes of, you know, the lighter you are, the more, you know, special you are, the darker you are, you know, all of these colonial tropes and how our familias reinforce it or don't, you know. I mean, one of the biggest selling products in Mexico right now, two of them are skin lightening cream. It's called Crema de Angel, you know, angel cream, right? So touching at the divinity. And the second one is, um, you know, you know, colored, con you know, lenses of contact, you know, colored lenses to have, you know, blue eyes, right? So again, you know, perhaps touching into Toni Morrison, the bluest eye, this kind of, you know, these very hyper Eurocentric standards, right? And how, how folks still reinforce these things in different ways. So I don't know if that's kind of can be. Yeah, Jonathan, I think you wanted to follow. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. You know, and I think in, in my chapter, um, you know, focusing on the work of, of Norma Montoya and, and really uh, following the, the work she did at the Estrada Courts housing projects in Boyle Heights. Uh, a lot of the youth that, you know, she put paintbrushes into the hands of were, um, you know, they're black youth, uh, Chicano youth, Chicanas. A lot of the Chicanas were the ones that, you know, carried over the, the, the activities on a daily basis. Um, but, you know, I, I think that in terms of, uh, thinking about Latinx masculinities um, in relationship to maybe white supremacy and, and white uh, whiteness. Um, you know, we, we, when, when Antonio Villaragosa became mayor of LA, you know, him coming from uh, East LA and from the barrios of, of City Terrace, everyone was, was elated. Everyone was, was um, super excited because you had this brown man in, in you know, position of power. Yet, you know, in, in the way that he operationalized his office, it was anti-Black, it was anti-working uh, class, um, very, you know, he, he uh, initiated, the, initiated the Safer Cities Initiative, which was, you know, really based on these ideas of protecting property over the needs of people. And so I think that, you know, when we take those kinds of things into account, it really, um, you know, shakes up how we think about, you um, the masculinities that brown people take on, right? I mean, he, as a brown person, we were excited, but he he really, you know, put into place uh, policies and practices that benefited, you know, um, white groups in particular, but but capital in general, you know. And so, I, that's the one thing I could think of. But um, I, I see Gabriel, you had your hand up, and I'd love to hear what you have to say as um, well. Actually, Jonathan, I'm sorry, Paloma was right oh, after you, and then my bad. Yeah. No problem. I just wanted to real quick say that the uh, mainstream um, popular culture, film, television have play a large role in making Latin looks, right? Uh, we're thinking of like Mediter Mediterranean features, you know, a lot of Italians have played Latinos in um, film and television. So I think that the, 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 like these mythologies around like pale Latinos those are very much there's a lot of investment in that there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of um there's like a lot of capital that goes into reproducing this idea of the mediterranean looking european you know looking maybe a tinge mestizo um and th so so that that's something that we we should be aware you know that we're that these blind spots are very very much manufactured. You know, there's a, there's very much an industry about creating these blind spots and having certain people, but not others, represent Latinidad. Um, also, in my classrooms, I teach Juno Diaz, who is Afro Latino, Afro Dominican, um, and his characters struggle with patriarchy. They struggle with the legacies of coloniality and patriarchy, as does the author Juno Diaz. But I like to ask my students, what are the consequences of these hyper masculine or sexist or misogynistic 
Like, what are the consequences? And I, I like to have that be the something that launches the conversation um, about Afro-Latinos and, and Juno Diaz, who's so popular, you kind of don't want to ignore his corpus, I think, in Latinx masculinity um, and, and, and bring that contra bring any of those controversies into it so that they're at the fore rather than something that we're, you know, um, hiding from or denying, denying dialogue around. Gabe, did you want to um, add to the conversation? Sure. I mean, one thing that the genetics tell us in Mexico is that, you know, um, on average, about 5% African, um, a percentage of North African, Middle Eastern. So we do touch upon that briefly. But in my other work, I'm, I'm more interested in indigeneity and African indigeneity. So what is Yoruba language? Like, how does that impact um, you know, Mexican Spanish, like that'd be very interesting. You know, one of our dances, um, there's a, a black masked figure and people say, well, is that, is that African diaspora people who, you know, who came and influenced that, that the picture? They said, no, this is Tuscalipoca. It's, you know, black meaning something at night or something. So um, there is uh, India Moore. She's uh, uh, Afro Taina star of pose. And she has put out statements as a, as a genderqueer actor being both uh, Taino and African um, descent and how not just colorism, I think that it's in indigenous studies, it's important to talk about colorism, but it's also limiting to talk about colorism because indigeneity isn't just a skin color, whether it's brown or red or, or white or, you know, that's the other part of it is that we don't want to just um, limit colorism as a way of indexing indigeneity. There's also language that's very important in a lot of our cultures and, and our customs and so forth. But I think definitely it's a part of what, especially in the Black Lives Matter year we've had, right? To say, yes, it's very important that we talk about colorism, um, but also to go beyond that with indigeneity, right? And in addition to that, talk about indigeneities that are different colors, including those from Africa, including those of the Americas, obviously, um, we have people coming in from the Philippines, right? So there's there's many different ways that we can talk about indigeneity that's color inclusive, um, but not pigeonholing a certain color with an indigeneity. You're you're muted, Fred. You're muted. We have so many questions. Um, Arturo, do you want to pull up the next question? Yeah, let's see here. Um, gosh, I don't even know where to begin here. Um, let's see here. Um, okay, so as a non-Latinx person, I've heard the people use Latin, L-A-T-I-N-E, instead of Latinx. Is Latin more preferred by the community? Um, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. I think, I mean, I'll just, uh, I, Latine is uh, definitely, I think Latine throughout Mexico and Latin America is, is what's being used. Um, Latinx, I think, has a very different um, context in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I think that the, that's, that's really the difference is the X, um, how, what that means in, in the US context, and then Latine throughout Mexico and Latin America. I don't think that there is a, a preferred, I think, I mean, just like everything, like identity, it's complex and it's, you know, self-ascribed. And so that's, that would probably be the best answer. Yeah, there's so many, I don't know if any of the other panelists or scholars, artists, creative folks in the book want to, there's just so many, you know, I could spend like three hours just talking about all these really complicated, you know, and important questions. I don't know what you would. Uh... Well, here's one that's kind of, you know, where do we begin, right? Thank you for all your work. If, if our goal is equality, shouldn't we dismantle masculinity and femininity? Which, <clears throat> you know, maybe I'll put put uh, Ginny and Gabriela in the spot, but you just totally, you know, disrupted 
you know, <clears throat> masculinity, femininity, being like a complete and absolute product of European linguistic and epistemological colonizations, right? So, but anyway, <clears throat> not to put you on the spot, but I guess I did. So, sure, I can say in our chapter we talk about the arroba, the mm -hmm. you know, a, and this was actually Jenny's <laughs> Jenny's research, but you know. Mm -hmm. um, keeping the, the feminine, but also the masculine like together, kind of like a swirl and like the caracol, um, the, the shell spiral. So it's like it is to a moment and then it changes into the other. And I would say that my goal is not equality or the disappearance of differences, but a different relationship that is non-hierarchical. So I think it's different mm -hmm. to say equal than to say in a balanced relationship among differences, including differences we have with, you know, with relative with people who are animals and plants and mm -hmm. you know, ancestors mm -hmm. who are not in our time frame necessarily, um, the future, right? Like so I think that is more of an argument that comes from a um center colonial trans perspective. Like let's just you know, make everything equal. But, you know, what if we already have land and we're indigenous, you know, do you want to just give that up to go to a city? Like, is that is that what equality means that we all become the same? But what if we have our own language? Does that mean we can't speak our language because that makes us different? That's how education has gone. So the equality question can be posed different ways. And I think some are very helpful, and I think some are. Yeah, I can just add on to that. I think um, I really love the comment uh, Maria Ramirez made about being inclusive. You know that that it's it's about the perspective, it's about the worldview, it's about the epistemology. You know what is our way of knowing, and unfortunately. Um, we've all been indoctrinated into a, a very Eurocentric way of knowing, and so until we, you know peel away the layers of that, it's going to be very difficult for us to think about language and people um, in, in that way. Um, and I, I, I was just having this discussion, I think some of my students might be here for my gender and sexuality class, um, that, you know, what, what if ever we just eliminated and just became they, um, everybody, and, and what would that look like? And so, um, and if in, and I do appreciate um, the question by Natalia, because I think that is, that's the conversation that's in process is mm -hmm. what is, um, you know, how do we, do we do away with these, um, the, the gendered um, notions uh, in language? Um, is that, is that the goal? Um, you know, th there's also the, I mean, we're still in the midst of that, of that argument um, of the seventies, you know, of, of the Chicana feminist of not wanting to, um, you know, I'm also a doula, so I work with a lot of uh, birth work. And so that question comes up in terms of language inclusivity when we talk about birth. When I'm talking to some of the elder midwives, they're like, no, this is, it's so critical that we remember the feminine and, and women giving birth. And then you have a, a much newer generation of birth workers that are also, uh, no, we need to, that's, you know, we, we really need to think about a different way of approaching um, how we think about birth. So I think these these are conversations that are in process right now that we're having. Thank you. So I see a really interesting question by uh, Fatima Casas, the how can decolonizing Latinx masculinity leave space and room for trans slash histories to bloom in our Afro Latinx community? Came here late, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so uh, Fatima, I, I, I um, Please check out the book. There's a, you know, we have several chapters that talk specifically about that. In fact, uh, Jackie T. Cuevas, the work that she was engaging with are, you know, <clears throat> by Afro-Latino, um, you know, writers and scholars and looking really at kind of complex gender politics within, um, you know, Dominican and so on and so forth. Um, there's other chapters as well. Um, that look at that. Um, um, it is queer or what, you know, so it's, you know, it's part of the conversation, right? And um, I mean, our hope is that, you know, is that this is just the beginning, you know? I mean, first, there's no way this book would have occurred without the phenomenal, you know, political and epistemic uh, offerings that 
Chicanx, Latina, mujer, you know, feminist scholars, you know, um, huge props to my dissertation advisor who <laughs> to this day I'm intimidated, I'll be intimidated for the rest of my life. Uh, Dr. Norma Alcon and then a lot of better. I mean, it's really, you know, for us who, you know, are present as men or our cisgender or so on and so forth to really listen and take that seriously, right? But part of what we're hoping is that this is the beginning of really creating spaces to really listen to, you know, two-spirit, trans-spirit, you know, transgender voices, indigenous voices, uh, African voices, Afro-Latino voices to really disrupt these binaries, these binaries that have been imposed through the violence of, of colonization and that get reinforced by, you know, white supremacist, toxic masculinities in the US nation state, right? So um, I don't know if anyone else has any, any other thoughts on that, but yeah, really powerful question. Cool, so I guess we have three more minutes. Any other, I'll just, anyone else take a question? There's so many here, so uh, what other questions do you all wanna kind of engage with here, either in the chat or the actual Q&A? Any other questions? Any other questions? Arturo, can I jump in? I wanted to say from more of a performance framework, um, not like Judith Butler and her concept of performativity and how gender is something that's, you know, performed. Um, also from a performance practitioner, um, I, I, I do performance work. And I think that each one, fem femininity and masculinity, all of these have liberatory prospects. And so I think trying to silence one or the other is not really getting at what is going to be liberatory. It's finding radical inclusivity, finding space for everybody to have the right to express their authentic, their, their, their authenticity without cruelty right like fight, creating safe spaces for everybody to have access to that range of gender performativity the way that it's authentic for them and to try on genders and to try on so it, it performance is a liberatory project where um we we can try on a lot of social skins and 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 figure out where our fluidity takes us um, so I just wanted to offer that, that we're not, uh, that I, I don't think the project here for me, where I see it, is about silencing masculinity or, you know, um, unfairly saying that, you know, femininity is, is you know, going to be the thing that, you know, we should be moving towards or has the answer, because those are all taking us into essentialisms again, um, rather than just opening space for that caracol, which I love, you know, that, that, that fluidity and that continuity. Wow. Wow, what a powerful way to end. This is amazing. Gracias, Paloma. Any, we have literally one minute. So any final palabras, anything, anything, anything? No? Wow. O otra vez, huge, huge gracias to all of those who attended, to all of the wonderful panelists, to Dr. Laura Perez. One of these days when we're COVID, you know, safe, uh, we're gonna, I don't know, take you to tacos or something, you know, you've been this such a huge support for so many generations of us and your work is just super inspirational and your leadership is just stunning on so many levels. So, um, muchas gracias and uh, it's great to see you all, I'll be uh, virtually and um, we'll, we'll keep each other posted as things, you know, evolve and uh, again, if any of us interested in, um, you know, working on a super cool project my hermano and I, Fede, we would love for the capital L to consider it and, you know, hopefully fast track it or green light it, not in the Pinto prison terms, you know, order it, <laughs> green light it and like get it published so you can, you know, get tenure and, you know, have your work celebrated in the whole nine. So muchas gracias and we'll be in super, super touch. Cuídense. Ciao. Bye. Gracias. Thank Take you, care, everyone. everyone. Gracias a ustedes. Thank you again. That was a fabulous panel. Thank you so much for all your beautiful work. Thank you. Abrazotes.